Hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. And um, my name is Alexei Obrik. I work in Israel um, and I work on things related to stars. And today I'm going to be talking about stars. So specifically about white dwarf neutron star binaries. And I'm going to try to convince you that they are actually interesting sources for LGWA. All right. So here is a typical white dwarf neutron star binary, at least uh, by impression of the artist called Mark Garlick. Uh, this is supposed to be an illustration for an actual real observed system. Uh, it's called ultra compact X-ray binary for U18, for U18 20 minus 30. It's an X-ray binary that is the brightest X-ray binary in the sky. It's a binary that shines an X-ray. That's, that's why it's called an X-ray binary. It's called an ultra-compact X-ray binary because it's very small in size. It has an orbital period of less than one hour. This specific binary has a period of approximately 11 minutes. Um, so here is the story of white dwarf neutron star binaries in a nutshell. If you get this story, you know everything about what happens to white dwarf neutron star binaries on the top level. So the point is that white dwarf neutron star binaries form detached. So there are two stars. One is a white dwarf, another is a neutron star. They orbit each other and they are detached. Uh, just recently, I checked the ATNF pulsar catalog and we see approximately 220 of those systems in our Milky Way. Some of those detached white dwarf and neutron star binaries are so close that gravitational wave radiation will bring them into contact. They have to be closer than approximately four solar radii to get into contact within a couple of time. Uh, right now in our galaxy, we know approximately 10 systems that will go get into contact within a couple of time. Not many, but it's enough to make good estimates on the rates of wind spirals. Now, once the white dwarf and neutral star binaries come into contact, there are two possibilities. If the white dwarf was of low mass, the system will survive. The system will live for a long time and will become this ultra complex extra binary that you see over here. Right now in the galaxy, there are 20, approximately 21 ultra compact X-ray binaries observed according to XRB uh, X-ray binary catalog. On the other end, if the white dwarf was massive, the binary does not survive, the binary merges. And in that case, the merger leads to some faint and rapid transient event similar to supernovae. Detached means that just two stars are far apart and don't interact. So they just orbit in each other. Um, so uh, this is a slide that summarizes the formation scenario of white dwarf neutron star binaries by the most recent and detailed study by Sylvia Tunen. Uh, there have been several studies, and the point of this slide is only to show you that the preceding history of how they form is quite complicated. For example, you could see that there was one massive star of eight solar masses, another massive star of five solar masses. One star at some point expanded because it finished evolution. Because it expanded, it started interacting with the companion, for example, over here. Later on, it lost some mass. The companion then later evolved, they again interacted. So this is only to say that there were different phases of interaction, and this whole prehistory is relatively complicated, and you have to make relatively many physical assumptions about this thing. But overall, there are studies that predict the formation rates of these binaries with an accuracy of approximately one order of magnitude. So. Speaking of the rates, so if we have, for example, these pulsars in the galaxy, the double neutral, so white dwarf neutral binaries that are not yet interacting, we can, for example, look at systems and check their characteristic age. Because if you have a neutron star that's observed as a pulsar, we can say how long it has been since it formed, because pulsars spin down and we can infer their age that way. So, for example, there's a very characteristic pulsar, J1141655. It has a characteristic age of approximately one mega year. And if you see such system with an age of one mega year, it means that they form approximately once per mega year, if it's the shortest lived system. Um, on the other end, we see the, these ultra compact X-ray binary, and we also know how long do they live. So therefore we can also infer their formation rate. And here is one important point. So, the in-spiral rate of the detached systems is approximately 50 to 500 systems per mega year per our Milky Way-like galaxy. The formation rate of ultra-compact X-ray binaries is approximately 0 0.1, 0 0.2 systems per mega year per Milky Way-like galaxy. 
So what does that mean? So first, it, like really two points. So first of all, if you're waiting for the next white dwarf neutron star binary in spiral in our own galaxy, you have to wait for approximately a few thousand years at least, more realistically, a few tens of thousands of years. So it's going to be a long time till the next one is going to really emerge and how we're going to be seeing it really in our galaxy. The second point is that among those that spiral in, only a very small fraction will survive and stay stable based on observations. So a very small fraction is going to survive as actually binaries. Um, this point is going to be important for us later. Um, in terms of the gravitational wave signal, so here is a typical gravitational wave signal of an ultra-compact X-ray binary. This is from the paper by Thomas Tauris. Uh, in here, you can see a track of an ultra-compact X-ray binary. When it spirals in, when it is first detached, it starts somewhere over here. It slowly spirals in, comes into contact, and then after it starts, it starts interacting, the evolution of this diagram changes and goes over here. Um, this has been done, or this has been modeled as a good case for this ultra complex history binary being good sources for LISA, because they have periods approximately in the band of 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 2 hertz. And well, for LISA, they're going to be quite visible. And in fact, uh, that system that I showed in the beginning for you, 1820 minus 30, is a verification binary for LISA because it's bright for LISA. So it's going to be observed directly. Well, I'll come back to the gravitational wave signals of white dwarf neutron star binaries further. For now, I would like to just give you some intuition of how these stars interact. In fact, this image is from a model of their interaction. And the reason I'm going into that is because uh, this has been a relatively big development in the field in the last 10 years. To understand how white dwarf neutron star binaries interact when they come into contact, one has to think about Roche lobes, I guess. Many of you have heard about what Roche slope is, but in simple words, Roche slope is an area where a star dominates the environment by its own gravity. So for example, um, in this case, there are Roche slopes of two stars of two-point masses, and in this region, this star dominates its gravity. The equipotentials are centered on this star, and this region, the other star dominates its own gravity. If the stars start interacting, then the Roche slope of another star starts digging into the surface of the companion. So that means that the star that has, in this case, the white dwarf, has a region where it dominates its own gravity, and also it has a region where the other star dominates its gravity. So in simple words, the companion will start stripping the star from the surface of its material. And what happens there is that material on the surface starts following the equipotential lines and goes like this and enters on the other region where the neutron star is. And the thing is that, well, this mass is lost from the white dwarf. The white dwarf is losing mass. So that's kind of the part of the interaction. So the star is losing mass from its surface. And this equation over here actually shows that um, the deeper this equipotential is in the surface of the star, the faster it is losing mass, and this dependency is very steep. So it's actually exponential. And if you just dig in by another meter, the mass transfer rate will increase by a factor of several, in loose words. All right, so uh, here is an equation, and it's not just to uh, try to show an impressive equation, it's mainly to show how does the mass transfer evolution depend on physical things. This equation, each term of it corresponds to actual physical process that happens in the binary. So what happens in the binary is like this. So there's a white dwarf, it loses some mass to the neutral star, it gets into the disk, and each of these things has some effect on the binary orbit in particular. So the binary orbit is affected by the loss of angular momentum, for example, into gravitational waves. So you lose angular momentum, the binary shrinks. So therefore, the Roche slope digs deeper into the star, for example. The binary orbit is affected by how the stars evolve. In this case, the white dwarf might, for example, be cooling down and shrinking by itself. Therefore, the Roche slope goes a little bit out. So that term also matters for the evolution. This other term is proportional to the intensity of mass transfer from one star to another star. It's encoded in this X term that stands in front of over here. It contains several factors. One is that if you have lost a little bit of mass, if you have moved some mass from white dwarf to the neutron star, the masses of the two parts of the binary have changed. Therefore, the Roche lobe radius has changed. So that term accounts for that. 
On the other end as well, if you tr take some mass from the white dwarf, white dwarf is a different object. It has some its mass radius relationship. So for example, if you take mass from the white dwarf, white dwarf becomes bigger. So uh, reversal again has some different ratio relative to its surface. So you have to account for that as well. White dwarf becomes bigger, how much more is it overflow in the Roche lobe? And then there is just a term which is related to, if you just take some mass from one part of the binary to another binary, then the orbit will be just changing because of the angle momentum conservation. So all these terms go, go into this modeling and basically there is quite, I mean, so all these terms are included in the models and people include them when they model the mass transfer. It's both complicated and not really complicated because each of the points, each of the, each of the terms is very well understood. There is one of the terms which is quite important. It's actually about the amount of mass, it's parameter beta that is lost from the binary. Um, I hope you can see that if you take some mass from the binary, then the binary orbit will also be somehow affected because the binary components will change their relative masses. So if you do that, then the evolution of the Roche overflow will also be affected. So in principle, the amount of mass lost from the binary and the angle of momentum taken away with this mass is potentially very important. Therefore, um, this is one effort where we tried actually to measure how much mass is lost from the binary and how much angle of momentum is taken from the binary. And this is actually a snapshot from a real simulation that we've been doing. And in this case, the um, white dwarf is represented by an area, which is the regular white dwarf um, material and uh, surface, the atmosphere, which is represented by a low density material. In other words, we have increased the resolution near the surface. And this looks like this. So this is just a demonstration that the code is reasonably modeling a binary white dwarf and a neutron star. The white dwarf is just moving around the neutron star and doing nothing. This is intended to be so. It just shows that the code is stable. In this case, again, it is the binary just before the interaction. Nothing is really happening. So moving onwards. In this simulation, we show how the interaction actually happens. The neutron star strips the white dwarf of its material. The material forms an accretion disk. In the accretion disk, material circularizes and becomes somewhat circular. Over time, the material from the disk starts to spread around, around the binary and form some sort of a cloud. And in these simulations, we basically have been keeping track of all the material, how it gets transferred to the other side and where it travels after. Does it leave the binary or stay in the binary? And if it leaves the binary, how much angle momentum it takes? because these factors actually are important for modeling the long-term evolution of the binary. Um, but also you could think of this video as basically, um, it, it actually represents quite closely the actual picture of how this interaction looks like. And you see that by the end of the simulation, the material that has been lost from the white dwarf forms quite a big cloud around the binary. And that big cloud tells us about the angle of momentum loss from the binary, which affects the long-term evolution. Um, so what we have done is basically calculated this parameter in that equation that uh, characterizes how much angle momentum was lost, and then have simulated the binaries over much longer time scales of millions of orbits. And when you simulate the binaries over much longer time scales of millions of orbits, you see that sometimes there are two regimes that I was talking about. So sometimes the white dwarf survives and sometimes the binary merges. So for example, here's a plot of the mass loss by the white dwarf, which is a proxy for time, uh, versus the mass transfer rate, which is a proxy for how strongly do they interact. And if it's a low mass white dwarf, we see that as the mass gets lost, the interaction rate, the mass transfer rate increases over time, reaches some peak value, and then slowly decreases. So that means the white dwarf has started interacting, inter interacted a bit, and then stopped interacting. If you take a white dwarf which is massive, then you find that, well, mass starts getting lost. The interaction rate or mass transfer rate is increasing. Um, mass keeps on getting lost, and mass transfer rate keeps on, sorry, keeps on increasing, sorry. And then eventually the mass loss, mass interaction rate becomes extremely very large and actually diverges. So. In this scenario, the white dwarf, or in this model, the white dwarf actually is disrupted by the neutron star. So having measured this parameter X, we've been able to tell which systems actually are merging and which systems are not merging. Um, 
This point might be interesting to some of you. So actually, some of the interest of binary is when this spiraline actually can have residual eccentricity. So in fact, uh, when this spiraline, they start the, the, the typical white dwarf binary, white dwarf crystal binary starts with eccentricity of non zero, for example, 0.2 in the case of pulsar J11645. And by the time they merge, they have residual eccentricity of 10 to the minus 2 or 10 to the minus 3. Um, in principle, if LGWA were able to find that eccentricity, say that uh, state that it's not 0, but 10 to the minus 2 or 10 to the minus 3, it would be possible to say that indeed this binary has started with this big eccentricity. So that potentially would be quite constraining for the formation channels. Well, uh, from all these experiments, it's been possible to state that actually that the critical mass ratio between the low mass white dwarfs and the high mass white dwarfs that merge or survive is approximately 0.2 solar masses. And that actually makes sense when you look at the interaction, uh, with the formation rates. Actually, you see that the spiral rate is very large. On the other end, the formation rate of these X-ray binaries is very small. But if you check the inspiral rate of the low mass white dwarfs, you find that the, the inspiral rate and the formation rate of extra binaries are actually consistent. Um, very well. So from this point, actually, I would like to speak a bit more about the merging systems. Uh, the history of modeling mergers of white dwarf neutral binaries have, been, have come in several waves. The first wave was when people were trying to model the white dwarf neutral binary mergers, which happened to massive white dwarfs by using 1D models. So in 1D models, people assume that the white dwarf is a disrupted disk. So they started from the assumption that the white dwarf is immediately a disk, uh, which is, has one, one axisymmetric symmetry. Um, in another wave of simulations, um, it was realized that the disk is very hard to model as 1D object because we don't know the vertical profile of the disk. So people started doing simulations which are in 2D. So they have started the white dwarf, which has been disrupted as a torus. So, I mean, so they were saying that, White dwarf is a torus, not a disk. And then the torus is evolved in a 2D code by assuming axis symmetry. Um, but then it was also realized that actually the disruption don't look exactly like tori or disks. For example, here is a snapshot from a 3D simulation of white dwarf merger. And you see that it's actually like there's a white dwarf that is shredded by the tides of the neutron star. It doesn't look exactly like a torus, doesn't look exactly like a disk. So that's why uh, there's been several 3D simulations done in particular in our group of these systems. Uh, so here is a video of how a massive 0.6 low mass white dwarf gets disrupted by a neutron star. Um, it just again confirms the mass that we have been inferring from before, but also maybe gives you some intuition of how it looks like when white dwarf merges with a neutron star. You can see that the mass transfer rate or the mass is getting stripped faster and faster, and eventually the white dwarf is, well, really tightly shredded by the neutron star. In a quite dramatic event, 0.5 solar masses have been just shredded. It's crazy. I mean, it's, it's a real thing. So, well, and here is an example of how this process looks like for a more massive white dwarf of 1.2 solar masses. And just this is just to show that the more massive the white dwarf, the more unstable, the more intense mass transfer goes. So in this case, the white dwarf is shredded actually only after a few orbits of the simulation starting. And again, all these things, I mean, so white dwarf has been just a white dwarf, and now it's a lot of debris, and actually lots of things happen in that disk. So here's the thing. Uh, if you've been attentive, I mean, maybe it's been hard to see, but I mean, if, if you look at this simulation, and if you look at the time over here, one orbit corresponds to approximately 10, 15 seconds. Uh, so that is pretty good because 10, 15 seconds just happens to be, and this is a massive white dwarf, like typical white dwarf that merges with a neutral star. So this mass just happens to be exactly in the white dwarf neutral star, like in the, in the close to the 10 to the minus one Hertz, which is very good for LGWA. So very fortunately, these systems are actually very well fitted for LGWA. This is a slide I borrowed from Valeria Corol. You can see that actually double white dwarf binaries uh, work well with LGWA, but White dwarf neutral star binaries work even better because they tend to be more compact. So, so this is fortunate. Unfortunately, if you take the strain from a given system, instantaneous strain, uh, from, a, from a typical population, from all the possible white dwarf masses and all the possible neutron star masses, then the instantaneous strain is over here. So uh, that means that uh, to be able to monitor a white dwarf neutral star binary in real time, you would have to have it at one kiloparsec away from you. So, which is like, I mean, so you will not be able to sell, I mean, 
the details of each orbit unless it's like really close to you. And the same really applies to double void binaries. I guess maybe it's been not spelled out very much in the talks, but it's actually also the case for double void binaries. On the other hand, fortunately, the spiral in of these wide of neutral star binaries happens at a rate of 10 seconds per year. So in other words, the binaries that are initially detached, far apart, spiral in at highest at 10 seconds per year. So if they end up at this location, then they actually have been in the LGWA band for 10 years, roughly speaking, not changing the frequency very much, which makes it really good because then actually accumulated signal will make them detectable from approximately few 10 megaparsec. So I think this is exciting. I mean, you could think about it in a different way. So uh, think of a double white dwarf binary and white dwarf neutral star binary. If a double white dwarf binary is detectable or a signal is accumulated from few megaparsec, the white dwarf neutral star binary has typically more massive components. So white dwarf neutral star binary has a neutron star, which is always 1.4, maybe 1.6 solar masses, and it has a white dwarf, which is typically one solar mass. On the other end, double white dwarf type 1a supernova progenitor typically is less massive. The total mass is close to the Chandra Sekar mass, sometimes a bit larger. So the total mass is larger, the chirp mass is larger. You can find out actually the frequency also shifts a bit. So altogether, this actually extends the range in which these systems can be observed. And even if you account for the fact that actually double white dwarf binaries merge fre more frequently than white dwarf neutral star binaries, this range actually totally compensates for that difference. Uh, here is just a simulation of a helium white dwarf neutral star binary just to show that actually the code is doing good things because they're not supposed to merge and they're not merging. Um, well, they're just not merging. So I mean, they just keeps on transferring mass for a long time and nothing happens. If you keep on tracing that, you'll find that even in this uh, code where you don't resolve the outer layers in much detail, the systems still survive. Uh, very well. So I would like to say a few words about transients, just, uh, just maybe for curiosity, but actually there's a good science point, point in there as well. So here is a diagram of all types of supernova that people have uh, been observed so far. It's actually not even complete. It just describes the most common types of supernovae. And this diagram shows the supernovae arranged by two properties. The x axis shows the duration of the supernova, and the y axis shows the brightness of the supernova. So there are different types of these supernovae, and more new types have been dis dis discovered continuously. Uh, you can find the classically well known core collapse supernovae, type 1a supernovae, superluminal supernovae, gap transients, which are in between type 1a supernovae and the novae. And um, the reason I'm saying about that is that actually, uh, this is quite related to also to white dwarf neutral star binaries. So see, the thing is that uh, when you try to model how a thermonuclear supernova, for example, double white dwarf supernova works, you think a lot about nickel. So the thing is that when two white dwarfs merge, they reach very high temperatures, they synthesize nickel 56. Nickel 56 is an unstable element that decays over time into cobalt 56 and eventually into iron 56. So the decay happens on short time scales of about 10 days, then later on 100 days time scale. And when, for example, white dwarf binary has just merged, this nickel decays and releases gamma rays and positrons, and gamma rays and positrons heat up the material around the ejector, and the ejector become very hot and glowing. So you see a very bright glowing thing from far away. So, you know, just, you know, you have nickel, you heat it up and you see it as a glowing thing. It's actually, this is actually exactly what is called a type 1a supernova or thermonuclear supernova. Now for white of neutral star binary, actually it's possible to also see that actually some elements are synthesized during the merger because there's a neutron star in the center. There's white of material that comes close to the neutron star and that white of material heats up by the neutron star and actually starts doing nuclear synthesis. And actually you can calculate the nuclear yields from this process and you find that there are different elements produced, but I think one of the most interesting ones is actually again nickel 56. It's over here. You can see that it goes up, 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 up to 0.1 solar masses for the relatively typical white dwarf masses. So this is quite good because in fact, the white dwarf neutral star binaries produce nickel. Nickel hits up the ejector, makes the thing glow and actually looks like a supernova. Uh, so to check exactly what kind of supernova it is, we have run a Radiative hydrodynamic simulation with a code called SuperNew, uh, mod modeled the light curves and spectra and found actually that it looks pretty much like the faint end of supernovae type 1AX. It's a class of supernovae, which is similar to type 1A, but fainter, and they're observed quite well and very well characterized. 
So the good thing is that it's going to be disco discovered at the rate of approximately a few thousands per year with LSST. So LSST is coming operational next year. It's going to be working maybe from mid next year. And the promise is, or the prediction is, that it's going to be discovering thousands of these systems per year. So we're going to be observing a lot of these systems. Um, so strange enough, I'm at the key points here, but I think that there's some ideas that come out from this whole thing. So first of all, I hope I have convinced you that these are relatively hmm, diverse and quite observationally rich systems. Uh, further on, um, these systems are potential gravitational wave sources, that is to say for LGWA. LGWA will be able to monitor these systems for 10 years before they merge from really quite far away. And on top of that, you know, if you monitor a source, you say that this is the source, it's over there, and then you see a source exploding as step on AX supernova, there's going to be a very nice connection, a very, very nice characterization. Um, well, I guess, well, these are multi-messenger sources, and well, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Are there any questions up there? So you were saying that when the white dwarf and neutron system comes very close, there will be like the white dwarf gets ripped apart and then there is also inspired. So how the gravitational waveform really looks, I was curious that because here one system is completely getting ripped apart and also they are inspiring. So what, how it, how, how it differs from the usual in spiral waveform when it's accreting? Uh, yes, yeah, so that's a very good point. So if you go to the very beginning, uh, so there is, uh, there is this phase of, uh, there is this phase of in spiral uh, where the binary is still detached over here. Um, during this phase, the binary is not interacting very much, and that phase lasts till approximately, depending on the device of the white dwarf, um, till last phases of the merger. So <clears throat> just to be very clear, so for example, if you're talking about a heavy white dwarf, for example, like the typical white dwarf of one solar mass, the interaction is going to be completely gravitational. There will be no interaction until approximately a month before the merger. So in the last month, uh, by the time of merger, there will be some modification to gravitational wave waveform because the mass transfer from one star to another star will modify the in-spiral. It's going to be, again, non-dry, some kind of like, as with the black holes, there's going to be some other things happening to the system as they merge. And one other thing is that when they really merge, the final few orbits that you saw in the videos, they potentially will produce some interesting well, ring down signal, as they call it, for black holes, for example. Uh, the only thing is, again, uh, just because LGWA sees the details of the mergers only from one kiloparsec, probably that phase is not going to be resolved, neither for double white dwarf binaries nor for white dwarf neutron star binaries. All right, up there. Wait, is it okay? Okay, it's working now. Uh, thank you for the very nice talk and actually the very nice simulations as well. Um, so there was one simulation on which I had a question. This was right before the blue simulations. Okay. So the ones in blue, right before that. I guess it's this uh, one. Yes, I think, it, I think it's this one where there is. So what I noticed after a while is that it, there seemed to be one location at which there was repeatedly a, a mass transferring and then there was no mass transferring. Yeah, you can actually see that CC, if you look at right it, here, yeah, it's I think very intense, right? And here it's a bit less intense. And then here it's very intense. And then here it's like, yes, exactly. I was just wondering. So naively, I would have thought that there would be some sort of axial symmetry, but obviously there isn't. No, th thank you. This is actually, I'm really happy you asked that question because that actually relates directly to this eccentricity effect. Because as, um, as yeah, this slide actually. So the thing is that uh, the white dwarf by the time of Inspiral, for the dominant population of Inspiral, we'll have residual eccentricity of 10 to the minus two or 10 to the minus three. But this also happens to be that, so in fact, during the orbit, the white dwarf at some point will go sufficiently close that the dwarf slope digs into that and takes away the mass. And then far away, the dwarf slope is outside of the white dwarf because during eccentricity, the relative separation changes continue throughout the orbit. So at pericenter or close to pericenter, it will be transferring. And then further away from pericenter, it's going to be not transferring. And this actually was intentional. So actually, this is one of the simulations. So we did a simulation with zero eccentricity, 0.02 eccentricity, 0.04 eccentricity, and saw the differences. Um, so it doesn't affect any momentum loss, but it affects the just the phases during which the mass is getting transferred. So I hope that explains it. And thank you for the question. Hi. Um, so are you able, like, I, you, you are like to track like the angular momentum, like gained by natural stars and. Uh, 
I mean, have you like a sample of the parameter? I mean, how much does it increase? I mean, how much can you spin up the neutral star? So, uh, right. So the thing is, yes, I mean, probably the most relevant slide will be the one with these uh, tracks, right? So <clears throat> uh, one characteristic thing is that the mass transfer quite quickly becomes super Eddington. So in fact, on this axis, the mass transfer rate was shown as the ratio between mass transfer rate and the Eddington rate. Um, so when the mass transfer gets close to Eddington rate, radiative pressure from the neutron star repels the material, and maybe there are some geometry effects that can help you circumvent that. Maybe you could accrete in some non-spherical non symmetric way. But if you exceed the Eddington rate by a factor of 10 or maybe 100, then it's going to be very hard to become non-lossy. So the answer to your question then is that the systems that merge, for example, they reach the 100 times Eddington rate by the time they accrete approximately 10 to the minus 7 solar masses for the, like, reasonable carbon dioxide by door, so 10 to minus 7 solar masses doesn't make the neutron star spin very much, to my knowledge. I mean, I think you need to accrete at least 10 to the minus 4 solar masses to make it spin, or minus 3. Um, if you talk about the, you know, uh, helium white dwarf binaries that survive and evolve into ultra compact extra binaries, you find that actually they indeed are able to accrete quite a lot of mass, and the neutron star indeed starts spinning, and in fact, we observe ultra compact extra binary, wherein sometimes the accretion phase stops, so typically the ones we observe are kind of old ones, Accretion phase stops, but the wide the neutron star turns into a pulsar mode and then later into X-ray mode. So these are called transitional uh, X-ray binaries, and these are actually quite quite interesting. So there they um, they manage to spin up the neutron star. Another question there. So thank you very much for the talk. Um, I have a curiosity and and a comment. The curiosity is: uh, is it true that the uh, wide dwarf masses of the known Ultra compact uh, systems are uh, very low mass, uh, so not not 1.2 solar masses, but 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 much less. And the the, the comment is uh, you mentioned uh, that LST we will find a thousand uh, on X, but that will be because it's exploring very high redshift, I guess. So that means we probably not in reach the 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 merging of the of the. Okay, okay, so uh, I guess uh, here to to answer so to answer to two comments, right? So to okay, one answer to one question, one answer to one comment. So the answer to the question perhaps is that in ultra compact history binary, the systems that we see have been there for a long time. So the thing is that they form at the rate of less than one per mega year. That means that the ones we see today have lived at least a mega year. So they have lost quite a lot of mass, and in fact, this uh, the first ultra complex binary, the brightest one in the galaxy, the most massive one that we see today in our galaxy has the mass of only 0.06 or 0.07 solar masses. And that's just because of its age, because they started closer to 0.2, perhaps, at least in this picture understanding. Uh, and then um, then by now, they are, I mean, quite commonly actually have masses down to 0.01 or 0.02 solar masses, which is like something what is left from the white dwarf, basically. And to your second comment is that the uh, horizon of detectability right now, according to our preliminary calculations with Valeria Coral, is that it's approximately a few tens of megaparsecs. So that means that probably at that, uh, that distance, the redshift still is not that strong. So I mean, we should probably expect that it's still in the band. So we're exploring that quite actively, so. Okay, maybe one last question, then we have to move on. There's some kind of uh, R process nuclear synthesis going on in the disk or what type of uh, nuclear synthesis? We were really very hoping to see our process in the disk. Uh, well, I should say, because you know, our process right now, people say that, oh, it's either collapsers or double neutral star binary. So maybe sometimes, uh, you know, maybe neutral star black hole, but really double neutral star and collapsers. And there's a lot of debate, like both both scenarios have pros and cons. And we're hoping that, yeah, white of neutral star binaries maybe spiral in frequent enough and we could make some our process elements. Um, but unfortunately, uh, you have to have our process for our process elements. So like, and for our process, you have to have a lot of neutrons uh, flying around in the in the material and just the amount of neutrons that we get from this nuclear post-processing is just not enough to get them, them there. So you need some kind of more intense way of merging them, but yeah, so, but it would be really nice. Okay. So um, what type of disk you consider? Like, I mean, this is the uh, geometrically thin uh, and uh, optically thick disk or adapt type of disk or what type of disk you, disk you consider? Uh, so I, sh I should say just, for people interesting in about the disks, so the, uh, the 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 first one, these simulations actually were assuming uh, that the disk has this sort of like a flow called nuclear dominated accretion flow, as in um, it's similar to advection do advection dominated disk, so not thin but thick adafs in other words, but on top of that, the nuclear energy generation in the inner parts of the disk would actually modify its flow structure. 
Um, our simulations also show that it's also non-thin just because of hydrodynamics, just because the, uh, the material hasn't yet had time to cool down. So it actually, like, yeah, it's a combination of nuclear plus heated uh, plus fresh material in high rate. And you have the Boltzmann transport of the neutrino itself also, right? Um, Not yet. We don't, but people in 2D simulations modeled the neutrino transfer, and they found that actually it's not modifying the inner regions of the disk that much. So it's uh, it's cooling the material, but not significantly. So it doesn't modify the dynamics. It's the nucleus. Okay. Thank you. Let's thank uh, Alexei again.